Hello Warlords and Generals, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be continuing and going off of the Ogre Maul Tribes lore and starting talking about the units in particular. There's not a lot here, but let's start with the Gutbusters and Noblars. Tiny and numerous, Noblars are distant cousins of the Grots, or Goblins as they're known by some players. Once rather sim living rather simple lives within the junk mountains of Scrapaspil in the realm of metal, until they were driven out by the Uryx, who had developed a favorite game of pulling Noblars giant ears off. Orcs, am I right? This is when they fled and made an unspoken agreement with Ogre Kind. They'd serve the ogres, and the ogres would protect them and not eat them, except for the most dire of situations. This symbiotic relation is completely lopsided, but the ogres are happy to have the Noblars around. They make for good minions, and the grisly meat saves them from being a meal of choice, most of the time. Ogres also rely on the Noblar's strange intellect and cunning in making sh makeshift weapons and metallurgy, for it is the Noblars who build most of the weaponry and artillery for the Maw tribes. In battle, they assist their ogre overlords, but also can be quite effective, even though they use weapons such as planks with nails, broken bottles, and sharpened scrap, an opponent who underestimates these diminutive creatures will soon find their soldiers drown in a sea of tiny green creatures and others dying to surprisingly accurate shots. Next, we're going to be moving on to ogres proper, and starting with gluttons. Making up the majority of the Maw Tribe ogres, gluttons are the fat soldiers Foot soldiers, loud, aggressive, and ravenous, and are known across the realms for their violence and their appetite. Even the most seasoned and bravest of soldiers can break from a terrifying charge from a horde of these bulky brutes, especially as they eat as they kill. Mountains of flesh and fat. Most gluttons use maces and clubs. Little grace, but all strength. Enough to cave in a Stormcast Eternal's helmet with ease. Even if these weapons break, they have a good backup, teeth that can chew through stone and metal. Among a pack, one of them is named a Crusher, for he is the most devastatingly destructive among said pack. Other gluttons may carry a banner into battle, decorate it with the skulls and bones of their favorite meals. Though on average, Ogre Glutton is capable of low levels of cunning, they're most of the time self-centered. Long as they're fed and Gorkamorka's appetite is under control, even shortly, nothing else really matters to the ogres. Honor and loyalty are strange concepts to the Maul tribes. They are just as likely to defend a neighboring kingdom as they are to join the raiders in search of food and loot as they ransack their former allies' fortresses. If a glutton fights alongside his tyrant for decades and feasts and drinks for the same, he is given a chance to become an iron gut. These ogres are among the most elite of the war gluts, wearing heavier armor and wielding heavy two-handed weapons to turn their enemies into pulp way easier than they would normally. Even after decades of service, a final test must be conducted before he can join the ranks. A concoction is created by the butchers that is intentionally harder for the ogre to digest. A few examples are actually fire crystals, a jabber slice sprain, or even a bubbling venom of a skitter strand or Ragnarok, though it differs from tribe to tribe. Those who survive end up having competitions of a strange nature within the Iron Guts. They try to outdo themselves with dangerous ingredients, even mid-battle. It is more often than not, a tyrant's gut guard is made up of mostly Iron Guts, as they are the toughest and strongest. A tyrant's own offspring will be more often than not be put into the Iron Guts, so the tyrant may keep an eye on them and end any ambition the children quickly and messily. Even though a challenge to their rule will more often than not come from the Iron Guts, for they are the most arrogant brutes among the ranks, Though they are his companions, there is no room for loyalty among ogre kind. Even with his mind, most other ogres covet the position. For after a battle, the Iron Guts get to pick the choicest cuts as they are the 
as they are also covered in blood and brains of pulverized enemies. Even if the battle seems a loss, a last minute reserve a charge from this elite group can shift a battle easily. So frequent is the case, there is a saying attached to them that is well known, which is, it's down to the iron guts. The next foot soldier are the lead belchers, ogres that have a, have a fondness for overall black powder and weapons involved with the substance. Loud and destructive cap capabilities are right in line with the typical ogre mindset and personality. Unlike most other races, these ogres don't stay safe behind friendly lines. They make up, they, may, they move up as they blast their opponents, their payloads off. These ogres usually are carrying cannons or crudely shaped barrels to use as black powder weapons, and if cannonballs aren't available for immediate firing, they will use rocks, debris, loose or scavenged weapons. Will do just as well. Another factor is their lack of caution and gunnery discipline, often covered in burns and blast marks due to pain due to point-blank firing and misfires. The ogres do not care. If by chance the lead belchers run out of ammo or reach melee, the cannons they wield make for great improvised bludgeoning weapons, still smashing their foes into a pulp whether it be melee or at a range firing off their cannons. These next two entries are the artillery pieces of any Elroglet Maw Tribe artillery piece. Which the first is the Scrap Launcher, a creation of Noblar Engineering. These crude catapults are created through whatever scrap the Noblars can find to build it, as well as uses ammo for the ramshackled catapult. The scrap that's loaded into these war machines tends to be fist-sized weapons or human-sized weapons. Too big for the Noblars to use effectively, but too small for the Ogres to handle. However, Noblars also like to add odd pieces of ammunition, such as poisonous spined animals, captured prisoners, and other odds and ends. After a battle, Noblars will look for their victims to see what landed only to laugh maliciously when they found a toenail of a gargan embedded into the head of, a te of, an, en of an enemy soldier. These catapults are hauled around by a temperamental rhinox, a common beast of burden among ogre maw tribes, and an effective hauler as well. For it is an enemy that gets close, few foes are prepared for a siege engine to charge at them as they approach. I guess you could say, with the Ogre Maw tribes, catapult charge you. The next artillery piece is an iron blaster. Mounted upon scrap, scrap built yet reinforced chassis being pulled by a rhinox, and iron blasters are giant cannons hurled into, hauled into battle to be used to crumble walls or forts within a few volleys. Many legends are told about the origins of these cannons. No matter the Maw tribe, however, the one they all agree on is the original was created from the Sky Titans. Whose floating cities, sky forts above the plains of Garan, regardless on if the endless march of time or the destruction of Gorkamorka's rampage, the sky forts and their titan residents fell, and the cannons were recovered by enterprising ogres looking for new weapons, loot, and food. Now some ogres can pay a hefty sum to gain ownership of one of the original sky cannons. The rest have to do with whatever cannon they can come across, for the sky cannons are extremely rare. Most of the time, other cannons are repurposed from city walls of the God King cities, as they do the same job of destruction and firepower that was required to crack open enemy forts. Now with the baseline stuff out of the way, I'm going to move on to the leadership of the Maw Tribes with the War Gluts, and we're going to start with the spiritual leaders, the Butchers. The shamans of the Gutbusters and the favored of the Gulping God. As both wizard and prophets, these mysterious spiritual priests use a strange magic in battle for the Maw Tribes such as putting both friend and foe into a bloodlust frenzy, conjuring boiling fat to drown enemies, and even melting armor as if it were sprayed with stomach acid, as the butcher channels the hunger of Gorkamorka itself. 
Many view ogres as crude, simple creatures, but spiritualism and religion are very important factors to them, and this is one of the main three roles the butcher serves. One of the others is being responsible for feeding the fellow ogres of their maw tribes. This is an important part to keep the maw tribes fed and going to spread the destruction of Gorkamorka even further. But to also appease the wrathful hunger of their god, they also choose the best meats, hack off limbs to use for later, and scoop up brains and organs for extra flavor mid-battle. When they cook, they get all the worst ingredients and gristleness in the meat by boiling them out slowly in a maw pot. The final task is to divine where to go next on a mall path to obtain more food, and even if it seems unorthodox or counterproductive, the tyrant and the frost lords will always follow it. For the butchers here from Gorka Morka directly. Butchers are chosen at a young age for variable reasons. Some are born with a maw-like birthmark, or even simply season the meat of some of their early meals. Whatever the method or the case, the gulping god has select them to be the shamans of the maw tribes, and lead their people into greater and greater feasts. Eventually, over the course of a lifetime, a butcher will begin to gain an even more and more giant and bloated frame, replace his hands with hacking blades and flesh hooks. These new butchers are now known as slaughter masters. Being living embodiments of the gulping god, these butchers are the personal chef of the tyrants. These ogres drag along a thrice digested metal cauldron, forged to the exact specifications of the slaughtermasters by Noblar engineers. When it is completed, its chains are connected to the flesh of the butcher and dragged behind them. This allows the ogre to conduct his strange culinary experiments even mid-battle. This cauldron is only for him and the tyrant, and any ogre trying to sneak a taste ends up losing a limb to the, to the pot itself, as the slaughtermaster chops it off. The slop is also super volatile, known to explode the innards of lesser ogres and even cause the slaughtermaster slight indigestion. These exalted shamans are accompanied by a team of noblars, who assist in putting the meats and ingredients into the pot feed the slaughter masters, and this is prized position among the Noblars. For it's easy access to food, materials, and relatively safe, but it does have its dangers, as feeding the snapping maul may lead to loss of limbs or of life, and the magic that these shamans produce is even stranger than that of your average butcher. As they eat, it affects those around them. They have done they have been known to chew on bones, causing all enemies near the slaughter master's bones to snap, making them all fall before the shaman. Such is their strange yet powerful blessing from Gorka Morka himself. The instrument that the butcher and the slaughter master use is the great maw pot. Within these giant cauldrons, the butchers slowly cook meats and various other spices and ingredients for the great feast of the maw tribes will conduct after every successful maw pass. The butchers will also use this pot to divine where the maw tribe must go next for their, for their next meal and food. In cases of large and intense feasting and cooking will cause a rift to open and a massive portal that will lead the Maw tribe to a bountiful harvest for a greater feast. In some cases, even smaller vessels are brought with the Maw tribe to feed them along their march upon the Maw path. Ogres with low stamina and minor wounds can take a quick sip of the cauldron and will gain a surge of energy and have their wounds heal miraculously miraculously mid-combat. The final entry we will be discussing the top of the food chain, for even the butchers and the slaughter masters are only second in command to those of the tyrant and the over tyrants themselves. The war gluts of the Maul tribes are led by tyrants, the biggest, meanest, and strongest of the ogres within the war glut. 
only being eclipsed by Ogre Tyrants or Frost Kings, but more on them later. These Ogres gain leadership through combat. Either the, tri either the Tyrant will defeat and disembowel the usurping opponent, a great humiliation to an Ogre, for they no longer have any guts. If the opponent wins, he devours the Tyrant and becomes the new Tyrant. Though this is not the only way for a tyrant to lose his position, a tyrant is responsible for not only feeding himself, but the warglut as a whole, for the feasting and obtaining food is not only important for feeding the ravenous ogre hordes, but a sacred task committed in the name of their form of Gorkamorka, and a tyrant that fails in this sacred duty is quickly deposed and eaten. Being bigger and tougher than the average ogre, they are also first dibs on any, not just meat, but also gear, wearing thick plates and wielding giant weapons, like the brutal thunder mace that turns men to paste, or a beast skewer glaive, a great polearm with a heavy blade, usually used for cleaving gargan skulls and slay giant beasts. The reputations of the tyrant's rampage and hunger also precedes them, for even if the enemy they're assailing manages to survive the barrage and siege, the ogres will devour all crops, livestock, and wild game within the vicinity of the assailed fort, will be, de will be devoured by the ogres, leaving the poor folk with little to uh, no food and the ogres decide to move on from the siege. Even if a city should give offering to the tyrant and his warglut, it is almost never enough to keep them at bay, for few, if anyone, has the supplies to feed hundreds of hungry ogres. Tyrants also develop strange specific kind of flesh, sometimes almost obsessively taste for it. Such example is Ogbart Oak Eater, who, some, who, uh, who de a meat fist who developed a taste for Sylvaneff bark. The obsession for it got so bad, he burned down entire forests to draw out the tree people into the open. This chase of bark has had some ogres complaining about the only e thing they've been eating is bark, claiming that they cannot sustain off of plants. These voices of dissension have been slaughtered and ground down to dust for him to, for to be sprinkled on Oak Eater's next meals. Above a tyrant is an over tyrant, and this is the next step up and the utmost authority among the warglots. Where a tyrant leads a warglot, over tyrant lead multiple in a giant empire of ogre maw tribes. These tyrants of tyrants are way tougher and stronger able to headbutt cannonballs mid-flight, stop a wild thunder tusk charge, and even brush an incredibly powerful magics right off. This is the resilience of the best of the best among ogres, and they are even more brutal in combat than any other ogre. They have to be, for only sheer brutality and show of force will keep that many ogres collectively together. And on that note, we have reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this coverage of the Ogre Warglut units. Next time, we're going to cover the Beast Call Raider unit lore and the Camp Followers, since there's not quite enough to cover Beast Claw or Camp Followers by themselves. I'm just going to smash them both into one video. I hope you enjoyed this lore coverage. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to see more of my more of my content, please subscribe as I try to upload a, one video once a week. If you'd like to leave any criticism or just start any lore discussion, please leave a comment down below on why you may like or even dislike this video. A final add-on is simply that I now have a Discord set up and even a Patreon for those who would like to support me in this channel's production. My Discord and my Patreon will be, I'll have a link to it down in the description below on top of my Instagram and my Facebook. And on that note, I hope you enjoyed this video and have a wonderful day and happy wargaming.